Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this particular tabi'i, the successor to the companions, he came to know that this sahabi is still alive. And he's living in Damascus in Damascus, in Syria. So he sets out on a journey to travel. <clears throat> that a uh, companion, a person who met the Holy Prophet وسلم, is alive, and I have this narration, this hadith, I need to go and meet him, and I need to verify it, and I need to hear from him directly. So to try to understand the importance of this narration, it's not that he didn't know the hadith. The hadith was transmitted to him, he knew it, he had heard it. There's a very good solid chain of transmission. But he said that I want to cut out one person in the middle. I want to get closer to the Holy Prophet I want to hear it from the person who heard it from the Holy Prophet himself. Instead of two people in between, I only want one person in between. The purpose for me mentioning this backdrop is to show you how within the deen of Islam, such people were there, such scholars were there, that they go to such lengths to preserve this deen and this religion that we do not take it for granted. This holy Qurans that we have, the tafsirs that we have, the books of hadith that we have, the books of fiqh that we have, the books of aqidah that we have, every single legacy of ilm that we have, there's so much sacrifice and qurbani behind it it is only befitting for us that we make shukr of this ni'mah. How much they've sacrificed for us to get this deen of Islam in our hands. When we lose sight of this, when we lose sight of that sacrifice that brought to us this pristine, pure deen in the lap of luxury for us, when we begin to fail to realize this ni'mah, then we take it for granted. When we take things for granted, what happens? We have no value. Eh, deen of Islam, eh, Quran, yeah, hadith. This is a repercussion for us not knowing the sacrifices that have gone before, how every single one harf, one narration, one word, so much sacrifice around the whole entire world. People have died over these ayat of Quran. People have given their life, their blood, their sweat, their tears. Their children became orphans, their wives became widows, they left their homes, they traveled thousands of miles in the old time way, on the camelback, on foot, over mountains, and through so much difficulty to learn this deen. No wonder there's a big difference between their iman and my iman. Today, the click of a button, or even on my phone, I'm just tapping through, and here comes this knowledge and this information. I'm not calling it ilm. There's a difference between ilm and knowledge and information. Today we have information. Oh, this verse means that. Oh, that verse means this. So it's information coming in with a thousand other bits of information that we have. The Sahaba, the Tabi'un, the pious predecessors of the past, they valued this knowledge and this ilm. So he left his home in Medina Munawwara. Right? And to give you an understanding of what a big sacrifice this was, the great Imam Malik, rahimahullah, Imam al darul Hijra, one of the great fuqaha of the four madahib, out of his respect for the city of the Holy Prophet وسلم, he wouldn't leave the boundaries of Medina Munawwar. Because out of this fear that what if I die outside of the boundaries of this beloved city, I do not want to be buried anywhere, but in the same graveyard where Rasulullah is buried. So he wouldn't leave, he wouldn't dare leave for anything. I am going to die here because I love this city. So this is the, the relationship that they had with such blessed lands. Now you have a successor, he's willing and ready to leave, but for what he in his heart and in his mind deems to be a greater benefit that I'm going after, I'm chasing after. I'm trying to get closer to the Holy Prophet by leaving because I want to create that alum and that knowledge. Right? We need to understand that we need to break this, this, this shell that has covered our hearts. We need to understand when we begin to sacrifice for something, you begin to cherish it, you begin to love it. And it's long overdue that I need to analyze in my life, what is it that I cherish? What is it that I love? What am I willing to make sacrifice for? Right? 
in this world, even today, we all understand that whatever it is that you love, you will make sacrifice and qurbani for. It's a beautiful story. I wasn't going to mention this, but it came to my mind. So I mentioned it, right? When I was maybe in third grade or fourth grade, it was a story. You read short stories in English class. It's just to teach us the concept of love. What is love? Because Allah forgive me, to be honest with you, we live in such a day and age, I don't even think I understand what really love is. Right? We're so busy. We're just running around, right? clocking in, clocking out, looking at what everybody else has, trying to find some form of happiness in life. We don't even know whether we're coming or going. We don't even know what we want anymore. We just know we want something. And whatever he wants, I think he knows what he wants. Let me go see if that makes me happy. Let me see if that makes me happy. Let me try to get a better car. Let me try to get a better house. Let me try to do this. Let me get two jobs. Let me get more money in my bank account. Will that make me happy? Will this make me happy? Nobody knows what's making anybody happy anymore. And this is such a day and age, it's all fake. Right? Everybody is trying to put on a fake front of what is happiness. When you have these phones, you have the Facebook, you have the, the, the Instagrams, you have these different people, and people are faking their happiness. Right? Ask the youngsters, the new generation. Somebody's going leaning on a car that's not even his, taking a picture as if I own this, this Porsche, I own this BMW, I own this Mercedes. You don't own it, it's not even yours, but Ed, I'm trying to put the picture onto anybody, look at me, I'm happy, I'm successful. We don't even know what we're doing anymore. We haven't even understood basic, simple things of life anymore. So the story of this love, to explain to us again what love is, it's all about sacrifice. We need to make sacrifice. We need to find something that we can sacrifice for, that I'm willing to give up all of my being, my love, my everything else for this particular individual or thing, and this is love. So the story goes, the short story, from English class. Right? There's another moral to this, I'll tell you that later, inshallah, but let me get to the story. The story is, and I'm going to encapsulate it and make it even more brief and very short because I want to get to the point. There was a husband and a wife. Right? The particular husband, yani the details, I long forgot what exactly the details were. But long story short, the husband, yani he had a watch, right? a very beloved watch. Ghaliban, if I remember correctly, it was a watch. But he couldn't utilize that watch because the chain had broken off. I think the chain that had broken off and it wasn't usable anymore. Like you have the watch and the wristband is gone. So it was a very beloved thing to him. Maybe passed down in heirloom generation after generation. Wallahu alam. So it was very beloved to him. And he loved it. And he cherished it. It's something very near and dear to his heart. Right? And we all might have such a thing. And his wife, right? Now she was known to have very, very beautiful hair, right? Long, like silky hair that would grow forth and so forth. And the entire community, everybody was praising what beautiful hair she has and so forth. And that was one of the things that she cherished, combing it, you know, taking care of it, brushing it, and doing all of these things. Now to show you the whole moral of this particular story, there came a time that the particular wife, Yanni, they weren't that wealthy. They weren't that very well off. Now, the combs and the brushes and the things that she needs to take care of the hair, something happened, hers broke, missing, lost, wallahu alam, whatever happened, and she needed something to take care of this. Now, both of these, they have something that they cherish, something that they love, something that they hold dear and near to their heart. Now what happens through the passage of time, and you know in, in, in their uh, mizaj, and their outward way and shape of how they do things, they have anniversaries, wedding anniversaries, marriage anniversaries, every year something like this happens. So on this one particular occasion, the husband says that, listen, my wife, she very much near and dear to her heart is her hair. And she has lost her brush, her comb, her this or that. So it means a lot to her. And for me, Yanni, I love this watch. This is all that I have left. I'm a very poor man. 
The final, final thing that I only have that's worth of any value, of monetary value, is this thing. So I'm willing, out of my love for her, because out of everything in this life, I love her the most. So I'm going to sacrifice, make qurbani, of that item and that material possession of mine, which is so beloved to me, I'm willing to give it up now. I'm taking this love, I'm sacrificing it for my true love. So he gives that watch away, sells it so he can get some money, so he can get this particular brush, comb, whatever it is he wanted to get for his wife. Half of the story. Very beautiful. Very touching. Gives us an idea that what is love? You sacrifice what is comfort for you, what is luxury for you, what is close to you, for somebody else, for something else, which is more beloved to you. Then you understand, because I've made sacrifice for it, that love that once was in your heart, that love starts emptying out. Think of it as a hard drive. We have more space in that hard drive now. It's a one terabyte hard drive, half of it is taken out. We have taken some of that love out of our hearts. I have more space now for more love to come into that particular hard drive. So he did that. He sacrificed that. Now look, look on the other side. You have the wife. And the thing that she loved the most, that was near and dear to her the most, was yani, her hair that she caressed, she combed, she took care of, she did all of these things. But now she said, you know, there's my husband. And my husband, he really cherishes and he loves that watch of his. Right? For whatever reason. But, yani, it needs to be used, something utilizable, something usable. It's broken, he can't use it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sacrifice and give up the thing that is most near and dear to me, which is my hair. I don't have any money. I don't have any other job. I have no other income. I have nothing to sell for this anniversary, but I want to make my husband happy. I really want his love. I want his mahabba. So what did she do in the story? She goes and she cuts off her hair. And she says, this is the only thing that I can get money for that people love this hair of mine, they want to turn it into a wig and X, Y, and Z. So she goes and she cuts off her hair. And when she gets that money for selling off her hair, she goes and she buys that chain or whatever else that watch needed. Now it comes time for their particular time for anniversary when they're exchanging their gifts. He sold the watch for her brush. She sold her hair for his watch. At the end, none of them got anything beneficial for the other. What is she going to do with a comb if she has a bald head? And what is he going to do with a chain when the watch is already gone? So none of them got anything outwardly beneficial, but what did they really, really, really get? They fell even more in love with each other because of that sacrifice, because of qurbani. This is what love really is. It's a story. It's a short story. It's not real. But a little bit, we come to analyze that, subhanAllah, what is the essence of love is to sacrifice and to make qurbani. For us, if we want this deen of Islam to become beloved to us, we have to sacrifice for it. We cannot go and chase every other desire, every single luxury, go live life to the maximum full potential that whatever we can do in enjoyments of this world, and still think that we're going to be on that highest level of iman. When the Sahaba and the companions, they sacrificed everything every comfort, every luxury, everything that they had. They like to spend time with their wives, they like to spend time with their children, they love to have all of the goodness of this world, but they said, no, we have a bigger task at hand. We need to spread this deen, we need to spread this knowledge, we need to gain this knowledge, and they sacrificed for the deen of Islam, they sacrificed for Allah, they sacrificed for the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's why they loved Allah, that's why they loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How much have we given up? How much have I given up? I'm talking about myself, I'm not talking down to anybody. This is for us to start waking up, that, SubhanAllah, Allah forgive me, but what have I done for this deen of Islam? For it to have that position in my heart. This is such a day and age, may Allah forgive us all, that we're sacrificing the deen, we're sacrificing verses of Quran, we're sacrificing a hadith of Nabi Wasallam to make ourselves happy. It's flipped, vice versa. Oh, that's just a sunnah. That is just a sunnah. So I don't need to do it because I want to be lazy. Oh, that's not wajib. Oh, that's not fard. One single hadith, so much sacrifice, he's leaving Medina Munawwara to go all the way to Damascus on camelback. Who knows how much of a month 
journey, two months journey of difficult hardship, how much money he had to undertake for his expenditure, for his food, cold nights out in the desert, fearing robbers, people killing him, marauders, rogue, who knows how many dangers were out there at that particular time, getting sick, no doctors, no medication, leaving the wife behind, leaving the kids behind for one hadith. Imagine what kind of love he had for the deen of Islam. How much love he had for the Prophet How much love he had for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would undertake that journey. And this is not a story. This is not fictitious. This is a hadith. It is real. It has happened. And for me, I want to live back in my recliner chair with my remote and just put on Peace TV or some Islamic channel or some Ikna conference, right? eating my popcorn. For us, this deen has become entertainment. You know, this is not going to work. There's going to be a difference of the level. So if we are looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we are looking for this deen, the point is we have to make sacrifice in Qurban. Now the story commences. When he leaves on his journey, he gets to the, ma the masjid, the mosque in Damascus, and he starts asking the whereabouts that, excuse me, salamu alaykum wa alaykum as do you know where I can find a companion of Nabi Sallallahu by the name of Abu Dardar After some initial kind of asking around here and there, they pinpoint a particular Sahabi. So this is Abu Dardar And he starts communication with him. And then he asks him that, I have come to you, it has reached me from so and so that you've narrated this particular hadith from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Dardar before he narrates the hadith, he puts him to a test. Again, to reiterate the point that I'm trying to make. He asks him that, have you come here for any business? You've made such a long journey. You've undertaken so much hardship and toil and difficulty to come here. Maybe you came for some business. Maybe you came to make some bucks in our lingo. And by the way, you're asking me this. Did you come here for tijara and business? Because no, Allah hasn't come for any business. Second question, maybe you came here to visit family. Do you have any family here? Do you have anybody else that you came to visit? Maybe you're here to visit them, you have some other work. And just by the way, you're asking me about this information. Because Wallahi, I haven't come for any of those things. I've come only for this one single hadith. So then seeing that he has no other niyyah, there's no corruption in the intention that you are really seeking knowledge. You haven't come here for any other intention solely to seek this knowledge and this deen. So then he narrates this hadith to him. And that's why I mentioned that subhanAllah, so much virtue and so much fabayah. Allah cherishes, Allah loves it when we, seek, when we seek this knowledge only for the sake of Allah. Not to fatten up our wallets, not to get more fame and name, mashallah, that so-and-so is here. Not to make it with so many likes on YouTube, right? It all boils down to the same thing. No, 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 no. I am only doing this to make my Allah happy to learn this deen because I love this deen. I've made all of this sacrifice for this deen. So then he narrates to him the hadith. Abu Darda radiallahu narrates him that Qal al Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Holy Prophet sallallahu told me, Man salaka tariqan yal tamisu fihi ilma. He narrates to him five different things, and I'm going to take them bit by bit by bit, piecemeal, so that we can understand. The very first of the five that he mentions, that the Holy Prophet said, Man salaka tariqan, right? Whoever adopts a path, whoever goes on a path, whoever enters a path, this can be a physical path, like he had taken a physical path. It can be any a figurative path. Whoever chooses a path in life now, that I want to learn this deen of mine. So whoever enters a path, yaltamisu fihi ilman. At this part, I'm going to try to take some time and explanation, because we need to understand it. In the Arabic, it has a different feel. It has a different understanding. As opposed to just in English, you translate it, You'll miss something in the middle. Yal tamisu fihi ilman iltimas. And where does this word come from? Those who know Arabic, 
Do you know that the three huruf al-asli, the three base letters are lam, mim, and sin, lams, lams, lamasa, which means to touch. In the ayat of the Quran, aw la mastumun nisa'a. Either ja'a halakum in al-ghayat, if a person comes from the bathroom, or la mastumun nisa'a, or you touch the women. Right? So it's got the meaning of touching. But here in the hadith, yal tamisuhu fihi ilman. How does this, if you change the scale from lamasa or lamasa to iltimas, it has the meaning now, whoever is searching for knowledge. Right? The grammarians and the uh, people who write the lexicon in a dictionary for the Arabic language, they mention here that think of it this way, right? Imagery. What happens when it's really dark? Maybe it's early fajr. And you can't see too well. You're waking up in the morning. You're looking for your keys. What do we do? We're looking around, touching everywhere. Where's my keys? Where's my bottle of water? Where's my wallet? You're touching around. So you see the kind of like process that is going behind over here. I need something. Has anybody ever lost a wallet? Right? Earlier in the day, I couldn't find my laptop. I was looking for my laptop. And I couldn't think of anything else except finding my laptop. I had a hundred other things to do. But I do not feel settled until I don't find it. And then I get my sukoon and tranquility that, oh, okay, alhamdulillah, I found it. Same way when you lose your wallet or when we lose our phone. Everybody's talking to us. I can't even hear him. I don't know what he's saying because in the back of my mind, I've lost something. Where is my wallet? Where is my phone? I've got to find it. Right? Somebody can tell me the most important information. I'm not, I'm not listening to him. I'm not thinking about it because in the back of my mind, I've lost something. So this is the way that we're supposed to have for knowledge and in. <coughs> That it's something like so personal and part of me that I need to find this knowledge. I need to know my deen. I don't have it. Brother, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for this other drama. I need to go and learn my deen. I need to learn my knowledge. Right? So this iltimas, looking for it, feeling for it, trying to find it. This takes me to another narration. Like I told you, I'm going to digress here and there and go in different directions. Right? Because there's so much, so much any knowledge and wisdom in our deen that we're taking for granted. And I'm being very honest. There's so much knowledge and wisdom in the deen of Islam that we're taking it for granted and we're throwing it to the wayside and we're going after the trash that they're offering us <coughs> in the forms of entertainment, in music, in movies, in videos, in lights, light shows. We'll spend a hundred dollars to go see a light show of lasers, right? It's just entertainment. Ooh, ah. And there's music and drums playing in the bracha and ooh, ah. People go to New York to see some ball drop on the New Year. Spending thousands of dollars, getting a hotel, doing all of these things for entertainment that will never benefit you in the least. It might harm you. You'll get shot, mugged, robbed, or something. Right? So this is what we are doing as human beings. And we have taken this knowledge and this ulum that has got so much value. The hadith of Nabi Sassam had mentioned, since we're talking about iltimas, searching for something that we have lost. For us, we have lost our way, we have lost our path, we have lost our direction. This is how I feel. I don't know what to do with life. I don't know what's going to make me happy. We've lost something. When we find this knowledge, subhanAllah, we find our track. We find our path. SubhanAllah, we can now see Salat al Mustaqeen. Allahu Akbar, I know, where I, I know what I need to do, I know where I need to go. I don't know if you feel what I'm feeling. Everybody in this world is feeling this way. The non Muslims should feel like that because they have lost Allah, they've never had Allah. But as Muslims, we have Allah, we have the deen, we have the Quran, but we're just giving it away and we're, we're attracted by what they're doing. They're already lost. We're losing ourselves, which doesn't make any sense to me. We're supposed to call them that, hey, you guys need to come this way. We have the treasure. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi has mentioned, since we're talking about this, that al-hikmah, al-hikmah, wisdom. Al-hikmatu, yani ilm, knowledge. Al-hikmatu, dalatul muslim. This knowledge, this hikm, this hikmah, this wisdom is the lost commodity. Dala, Dala to Muslim. It's a lost commodity of a Muslim and a believer. But Ainama, what did the who? 
wherever he finds this hikmah and this wisdom, فَهُوَ أَحَقُّ بِهِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ لَيْسَةُ السَّلَامِ Wherever he finds this knowledge, he is entitled to it because it's his lost commodity. It's like your lost wallet. You don't need to make a claim. That's my wallet. I found it. So you can just take it. So that you are a hakubihi. You are rightful to take it. It's yours. If it's your phone, you lost it somewhere. Somebody else has it. You just take it back. This is my phone. Put it in your pocket. So this knowledge is our lost commodity. The Muslim and knowledge go hand in hand. Wherever we find it, we are more rightful to it. Which means what? Look for it wherever you can find it. Try to acquire more and more of it. Right? Now from this, subhanAllah, there's so much that we can kind of go into. Right? There's so much that we can go into. Shaykh Hamza Yusuf, yani Hafizahullah, may Allah bless him, he mentions a very beautiful story. It's a beautiful story. But most people, they didn't really understand it, right? And some people, they'll raise objection against it, right? This is when we're very shallow, when very narrow-minded, when we're not really settled upon our iman, then a person, he's going to be bothered by this. For me, I wasn't bothered by it. I didn't mind it. I, I took the moral of the story. Like before, I narrated to you this fake, fictitious, fable story about a husband and a wife and the hair. It wasn't real. But you get the point, right? So Shaykh Hamza Yusuf, beautifully he mentioned the story of a Buddhist monk, right? Here we're Muslims in the masjid, in the house of Allah, talking about a Buddhist. Now many people who don't have knowledge, who don't have hikmah, who don't have wisdom, they already start frowning. What are we doing talking about the Buddhists? Are we gonna talk something bad about them? Yeah, let's talk something bad about them. Let's put them in the fire of Jahannam. Put everybody in the fire of Jahannam, it's fine. We're the best people, although we don't know what we're doing. Right? And everybody already becomes so defensive. Like, listen to the story. Listen to the story. If I have to, I'll narrate a story about an atheist. A person who doesn't even believe in Allah. To make a point. To make a point. Right? We have to be intelligent enough, smart enough. Right? Have enough itminan in your iman to understand the beneficial point that we take out of the story and leave their false beliefs to the side. We're not substantiating their false beliefs. I'm not even talking about this. So he mentions the story that there was this Buddhist monk, right? Those of you who know anything about Buddhism, you know it's not even a religion. It's more of a philosophy. It's more of a way of thought. It's a philosophy nowadays. So this particular Buddhist monk, he was there with some of his senior, senior like students. They're not students, they're like disciples. So they're the more senior one. And a junior disciple, a junior student comes and he wants to learn under this Buddhist monk. To understand it in our context, let's just call him a sheikh. In our context. So you have senior students going to the senior, senior sheikh, and they've been him with a while, and then you get a junior coming up and he wants to learn and study. So this particular monk, what we will call a sheikh, he then says to him that you haven't even learned the basics. You haven't learned the basics. You haven't learned the simple, small things. Where are you going to come and understand the big things? So he didn't understand what he's talking about. So he told him, you haven't even yet learned how to breathe. Breathe, breathe, inhale, exhale. You haven't learned yet how to breathe. And this person, this junior, this youngster, he was just dumbfounded. What do you mean, I don't know how to breathe? Breathing is what? Do we ever think about breathing? We never think about breathing. We just breathe. What is this thing called when you don't think about anything anymore? When it just happens, what do we call this thing in English? Subconscious. Subconscious. Conscious is when you're aware. Subconscious is when you're not even aware anymore. Subconscious. We subconsciously breathe <coughs> oxygen. Right? And there's a point I want to make from this. Allah forgive us. Breathing is understandable to be subconscious. The body does it. In the base of the brain, there's a stem. It takes care of this. It regulates this for us. But our condition has become such today, I'm talking about myself. 
when I stand up for salah, and I say Allahu Akbar, <coughs> and I start to pray, I am praying subconsciously. I put on the tape recorder, Allahu Akbar, and I start Fatiha, I start a surah, and my mind is on autopilot. It's just going. I have to go to Ruku now, I have to come up for Qawma, I have to go into Sajda, I have to come up in Jalsa, I have to go back into Sajda. It's like autopilot. When I'm driving down, I have a half hour drive, one hour commute, I'm driving subconsciously. I'm not even aware of what's going on. My mind is here, there, everywhere. Our whole life has become subconscious. It's just on autopilot. I don't know, maybe you're different, but for me, my whole life seems to be on autopilot. Which means what? It's not just me, it's not just you. The whole world is feeling the same thing. That's why when you go through and read these articles and listen to people, there's a movement. There's a whole movement out there. What do they call it? Mindful. Learning to become mindful. Learning to re-control the brain again. Take over our conscious. Pay attention to what we're doing. So this particular monk or sheikh told the student, you haven't learned how to breathe. And what did he mean by that? He told the senior student that you take him and teach him the lesson. So what did he do? He took him and they dunked him in the water. The well, the stream, whatever was there. Dunk his head in the water. And they keep him forced under the water. Five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. And keep him down and to where he can't breathe now. He's about to drown. He's about to drown. And when he can't take it anymore, they take the head out of the water, and what is the first thing that he does? <gasps> he takes in that oxygen. <clears throat> See, we took it for granted. <coughs> we took this breathing for granted because we're doing it subconsciously. We didn't understand the value of this air that we're breathing in because it was coming for free. But now when he's about to lose it, when he's about to drown in that water, when he's about to die, and then he takes that breath of air, and he's like, SubhanAllah, this oxygen is so sweet. Before we lose it, and that's when you begin to cherish and value something, SubhanAllah, I have never breathed like this before. Such a ni'mah Allah has given us in oxygen, but we take it for granted. When are we going to understand the value of it? when you're thrown off a cliff and a bridge and you're gonna drown in the water? That's when we're gonna cherish it. Oh Allah, one gulp of air, one breath of fresh air, right? If you're in a burning building and there's smoke everywhere and there's no clean oxygen, it's just heavy smoke is going into our lungs and we're about to die now. Now we're gonna cherish the oxygen. Oh Allah, one gulp of fresh air now. And we have this thousands, tens of thousands of time every single day. Why aren't we cherishing our breathing? Why aren't we breathing mindfully? And that's exactly the lesson that that particular monk wanted to teach the student. That you don't even understand life. You don't even know how to breathe. Where are you gonna learn anything beyond that? And this is a beautiful lesson, right? We take the beautiful story and the lesson out of it. Forget their aqaid and their beliefs of the outside. There's like, subhanAllah. What does this have to do? Al-hikmatu dalatul muslim. Wisdom is a lost commodity of a muslim. Subhanallah, we take the point that subhanallah, I should make shukr of this ni'mah. The story is what? The, lo the moral of the story is what? Shukr. We have to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we are grateful, what does Allah mention? La in shakartum la azizannakum. If you show shukr and gratefulness from my ni'mah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll increase you in that ni'mah. If a person makes shukr for his breathing, you think he'll get lung cancer? You think Allah will take away? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away things to teach us a lesson. If every single, with every breath, we're making hamd and shukr of Allah. It's almost as if to say we're feeling the gratefulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every breath. What, why would Allah test us? Why would Allah take away that ni'mah? He will increase that ni'mah. And like this, there's so many more things for us to be grateful for. Right? Our eyesight, subhanAllah, the eyesight that we have. When have I just stepped outside to look that I can see so clearly? I can see the beautiful faces, I can see the beautiful children. My ears, I can hear things, subhanAllah. Right? There's so much to make shukr for. 
if we do all of these things, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? SubhanAllah, our life is going to change. We're going to enjoy life. Just sitting here with our kids and our family. Before we'll yell at them, we'll scream at them, we'll do this, that I'm so busy, you're in my way, get out of my way, I gotta do this, I'm late for work. We don't know what we're doing to the kids. But Allah forbid that kid gets hit by a car, he becomes paralyzed, or Allah forbid he dies. And then we start saying, Astaghfirullah, what did I do to my child? He just wanted my attention. Oh Baba, oh Mama, they're just tugging at you over there. And today we're just, get out of my way, I'm late for work. Right? We take them for granted. We take everything for granted. Until Allah teaches a lesson and takes it away, then we're going to learn the lesson, then it's too late. No matter how much we cry, no matter what we do, it's not going to change it. You won't get it back. Allah forbid if a person gets a lung cancer, now a person wants to say, oh Allah, oh Allah, I want to make shukr, I want to breathe. When that oxygen tank is there, a person can't breathe. Now, it's too late. This, this lesson is gone. Right? But the mu'min and the believer is who? The one who learns a lesson from the trials of other people. That's one of the lessons for us too. This ilm and this knowledge for us, we need to go, we need to, we need to learn it, we need to sacrifice for it, we need to change our whole outs, our outlook, our behavior, and, and start learning this. How much time? Um, let's up and take whatever. No, I, like, I don't want to overtake the time because this can drag on. This can go for very long. Go for five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes? So now I have to make it more mukhtasar. Because it's something I'm talking about uh, passionately. <coughs> because I'm noticing it within myself, within the family, within the friends, within the students, within the whole of society, that we've lost our compass is no longer showing the right direction. Our bearings are off. The bearing of our compass is off. We cannot find Sirat al Mustaqim anymore. We don't know where is a straight path. We don't know where we're going. That's how I feel. Despite the fact that we have this deen, despite the fact that we have the sunnah, we're looking for success, we're looking for happiness, we're looking for everything in all the wrong places because of the environment in which we live. When, if we just take a step back, we go back to the asl, go back to the Quran, go back to the sunnah, go back to the original days. Imam al-Malik rahimahullah beautifully mentioned that the latter days, the people that are coming at the end of this ummah, they will not find success. They will never find falah and success, except with the very first thing that this first part of this ummah found success. That was coming back to the Quran and the sunnah, that sacrifice, that qurban. For us, we want to find success. In any other avenue, we're not going to find it. If we think we need more wealth, we don't think that the oil-rich countries of Saudi and Qatar and Bahrain and Dubai and all these, we don't have enough money. Right? We have more money than the Ummah has ever had before. We think money is a solution. We think that we need to have weapons and we need to have an artillery and we need to have missiles and these things and then the Muslim Ummah is going to become great. No, 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 no. no. We, we need to have more doctors and engineers and chemists. That's what we need more of. No, 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 no. You're not going to find that success until we don't go back until what the early part of this ummah found success. That was standing firm by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his ahkam. Stand up for that Quran and stand up for those ahadith. It doesn't make sense to us. It will not make sense to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one. It's in his hand. The control lies in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to go back to that ummah. We need to go back to that particular way, that particular <laughs> lifestyle, and then we'll find success, we'll find happiness, and we'll find that Sirat al Mustaqim. In brief, in short, in the next couple of minutes, I know it's not doing justice to the hadith, but everybody wants to know the remaining of the hadith. This was just only the first part. Man salaka tariqan, yaltamisu fihi ilma, sahalallahu lahu bihi tariqan ila jannah. I didn't even finish the first part. See how much knowledge is within our deen? A person who treads the path to seek knowledge, and seeking it in this way, sahalallahu lahu, Allah will make easy for him the path to Jannah. Our work is done. Entering Jannah is difficult. It's very easy. Just go seek knowledge. Allah will make the path to Jannah easy for you. Easily a person will enter the Jannah. Your whole life will change if we just seek the knowledge. That's number one. Number two, 
وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَتَذَعُوا أَجْنِهَةَ رِدًّا لِطَالِبِ الْإِنْ The angels will place their wings. They will humble themselves, place their wings down under the feet of the seeker of knowledge out of happiness of what they're doing. And what does it mean for the angels to put down their wings? I've experienced this many times myself. Many our affairs will be facilitated for us, made easier for us. Sometimes I'm thinking about something, I want to actually understand something. I'll be in class with some of the students. I've never understood this before. Somebody will ask me a question. I never even thought about it. But because my intent is to learn something or to try to give an answer, this thought will come into the mind out of I don't know where. Right? And an answer will come from I don't even know where because I never thought about it. And then I'll just say that this seems to be the answer. Wallahu alam. And those who have ever taught, you know what I'm talking about, that I've never had this experience before, it just came out of nowhere. So these angels and these malaika, they're going to aid and they're going to assist us and facilitate for us this path. And number three, A person yani, who studies and studies and studies until he becomes knowledgeable. When he becomes knowledgeable, Every single person in the heavens and in the earth, to the extent of the fish in the seas, in the ant and the ant hole, will ask maghfira, Oh Allah, forgive this person. Oh Allah, forgive this person. Oh Allah, forgive this person. The entire universe and the entire creation of Allah is asking for our forgiveness, for our shortcomings and our sins. If we seek this knowledge with sincerity, is there any shak, any doubt that remains that our sins will be forgiven by Allah? Because the entire universe, yani, they're making maghfira for us. Oh Allah, forgive him. Oh Allah, forgive her. She or he is a student of deen. This is what we want. We want to go into Jannah easily. We want our sins to be forgiven. We want all of our affairs to be facilitated for us. Things happen, happening for us we don't even know. The angels are doing stuff for us. Why? Because we're seeking knowledge. We're seeking to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth thing, right? what virtue do we have? How do we fare in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? وَإِنَّ فَضْلِ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ The virtue of an alim, a virtue of a person who has knowledge and ilm, عَلَى الْعَابِدِ over a person who's a worshipper. It's like the virtue of the moon, Laylatul Badr, on the full full moon, when it's on its 14th night, so bright, so luminous, right? So much nur is emanating from it. Over other stars in the sky. So an alim, a person who has done the sacrifice to seek knowledge, what virtue does he have? The bright full moon, and we're talking about al abid over a worshipper. I can spend time worshipping Allah. Praying salah, fasting, doing all of these things and worship Allah. And this is good, it has nur. It's like the stars in the sky. But a person who spends that time to seek knowledge, subhanAllah, it's like the illustrious full moon. How can you compare the two? How can you compare the nur of one to the other? There's no comparison. And finally, وَإِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ وَرُثَةُ anbiya. These people who seek this knowledge and gain this knowledge, what are they gaining? Al-ulama waratatul anbiya. They're inheriting from the prophets. They're the inheritors and the heirs of the prophets. Wa in al anbiya alam yuwaridu dinar al dirhama. These prophets they don't leave behind dinars and dirhams. They don't leave behind dollars and cents. They don't leave behind any physical monetary goods. In the ma waratul ilm, what they do leave behind is knowledge. Faman akhadahu, whoever takes that knowledge from the prophets. They have taken a very immense share, a great share they have taken of this dunya, because everything else is going to go to waste anyway. What, what is it going to have? What benefit is it going to have in the akhirah? This whole world and everything in it will be destroyed. But this knowledge that we gain, subhanAllah, this will transfer into the hereafter. Right? So may Allah give us tawfiq to do justice to seeking knowledge in ilm. Every single one of us who has come here tonight the intent, seriously, let's not do it subconsciously. Let's really pay attention that when we came here tonight, my intention was that I want to increase my ulum. I want to increase my knowledge. I want to increase my relationship to Allah. Right? Let's continue this trend. 
Let's pack out this place completely. Let's tell other people that SubhanAllah, you're wasting your time. And this night, Saturday night, a weekend night, how many of us Muslims, Allah forgive us, are going out? And you're wasting time in the movie theaters. Wasting time in some shopping malls, window shopping, not even buying anything. Wasting time doing all kind of useless activities. But Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us the tawfiq to come to sit in one of the houses of Allah. We should make shukr over this. We should be very happy about this, grateful for this. That, oh Allah, Alhamdulillah, you brought me here. Oh Allah, give me the ability to come again and again and again to increase my knowledge. Look for more gatherings like this. Have these gatherings at home with your children, with your wives. At least take a day out of the week. Let's learn some deen. Let's read some Quran. Let's read some Ahadith. May Allah give us a tawfiq. Wa ahmadu wa alhamdulillah.